Hey everybody, I want to talk to you about F statistics and eventually ANOVA. Um, but yeah, we're going to start with the simple bit, which is F statistics, which ANOVA is derived from. And we'll talk about all of what ANOVA stands for and what it means and all that in a little bit. But first, let us go look at the whiteboard. So, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't put this uh, back to the beginning. My bad. There we go. So an F statistic is a ratio of two variances. That's literally all it is. It's a, it, well, it's technically a little bit more than that, but that, that's what we're going to use it for. Um, we're going to use it to, de to do two different things. One of them is the really simple thing, um, which is to determine if two sample variances are from populations with equal variances. So in other words, we're going to take two samples uh, and compare their variances to each other and see if we think the population variances that those, those sample variances are representing are equal or not. Um, that's called the two sample F test. It's super simple. There's really not much to it at all. And so that, that won't be any big deal. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that in this video. And then the next video we'll explain ANOVA, which, which takes some explaining. Um, because the other thing we do is a more complicated version of this called ANOVA. ANOVA stands for analysis of variance, right? It's, it's uh, let's see, what do I say? ANOVA. All right, that's it. It's analysis of variance. That's all, that's all it stands for. Um, and then to start off, though, the thing that we want to see is the F test statistic is this. S1 squared over S2 squared. Like I said, very, very straightforward. Um, yeah, that's, a, that, that's basically it. Now, one of the things that we have to do, well, uh, let, let's do a, talk a little bit more about F, and then we'll do a test, and I'll explain some of the assumptions we got to make. There's really only a couple. So... Um, a thing we haven't talked about much, uh, I mentioned it in the, um, what was the topic two video? Um, but variance has degrees of freedom, uh, or variance in st standard deviation has degrees of freedom, and variance is just standard deviation squared, so it sort of inherits them. Um, and it's it's got n minus one degrees of freedom. So if we sample n things, the variance of those n things has n minus one degrees of freedom, which is relevant to us because when we're calculating our F statistic, we get some degrees of freedom in the numerator and some other ones in the denominator. So we've got two sets of degrees of freedom for F statistics. That's fine. Turns out not to really um, not be difficult at all, but that's that's where they come from. Um, and uh, so yeah, so when you're specifying what F distribution you're looking at, you have to put both of those into your calculator or spreadsheet. In fact, let me show you what F distributions look like. Did I? I must have it somewhere here. There it is, yeah. F distributions look like this. So uh, a couple of things I want to mention about uh, F distributions. So they, they have different degrees of freedom, right? So the, the D that they've got here are, are degrees of freedom. Um, this, is the, this is from the Wikipedia article on uh, F distributions. So if they both have one degree of freedom, you get, you get this thing, this, uh, this distribution right here. When they both start getting some reasonable number of degrees of freedom, that's when they start looking more like uh, this. Uh, they they kind of look like chi-square distributions, but they aren't. Um, and like one, one of the ways you can tell they're not is if you remember chi-square distributions have a mean of the number of degrees of freedom. So like when we're doing like a big chi-square, you can get like a big mean, you know, 50 or 60 or whatever. Um, F distributions always have a mean of one. So notice everything here is, is set up to have a mean of one. I know it kind of looks like only this one does, but that's not the case at all. These have a mean of one. It's just that the mode, the, the highest point is to the left of one because they're heavily right skewed, right? And that right skew pulls the mean to the right. And so, yeah, they, they all have a mean of one. And we'll see why in a sec when we do the, the uh, two sample F test, I'll explain a little bit. But uh, yeah, they, that's what they look like. They're right skewed. If you get enough degrees of freedom, they kind of look like a normal-ish distribution, but they're not. They're always right skewed. Um, yeah, so this is what they look like. So if you're sketching one, I usually sketch it uh, to look, you know, I usually do one uh, like uh, this deal, something like that, right? That's what my, my F distributions look like um, when, I, when I'm sketching. So let's do, uh, let's do an example. So back to the whiteboard here. Um, so a couple things I want to say about a two sample F test, uh, I guess, as we do the example, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit before it, um, for the test that we're doing, we have to assume that, or the, the null hypothesis has to be that Sigma one squared equals Sigma two squared. 
that the, the, the ratio of sigma one to sigma two is, is one, which is why F is always centered at one is because we're, we're making that assumption that sigma one and sigma two are the same. And so um, that's, why, that's why everything comes, out to, comes to average out to one. Now, a more interesting question is why is it always right skewed? And why doesn't it ever go below zero? And um, I guess I'll just sort of hand wave at those things and say that it's right skewed because you can get as big a ratio as you want, right? If, if S1 is a thousand and S2 is one, the ratio is a thousand to one. It's not very likely, right? If if we were thinking that that sigma one and sigma two were equal values, it's very unlikely that we would get a sample where S one's a thousand and S two is one, right? Like that'd be that'd be really odd. That's why the probability is very low. But you could, in theory, get something like that. If it's the other way around, though, if like S one is one and S two is a thousand, you don't go negative. You just get really close to zero. So if I go look at um, this picture again, something like uh, S1 being three and S2 being one, like leaves you out here, right? Not super likely, right? That's in what, 5%, 10%, something like that probability. Um, and same for the other way around, right? If S1 is, uh, S1 is one and S2 is three, you also get something like, uh, you know, uh, whatever, a third, I guess, right? So a little more likely there, but that's the basic idea. So you can't go below zero because the S1 and S2 are both variances, which are always positive, right? They're just standard deviations squared and standard deviations always positive. The variance would be positive even if it wasn't. Um, but the ratio can be as big as you want and it can be as close to zero as you want, but can't go negative because they're, they're both always positive. So that's why you get the, this thing where they stop at zero, but go to the right forever, right? And then but they're decreasing to the right because it's very unlikely that one of them is significantly bigger than the other one, right? That, that'd be really unusual if the null hypothesis was true, which is where we're getting these, these graphs from. And our null hypothesis, as mentioned, is that sigma one squared equals sigma two squared. So I should, uh, let me, let's go over here and write down those, uh, those hypotheses. So we're gonna have the null hypothesis uh, sigma one squared equals sigma two squared. And our alternative can be right, left, or two-sided. We'll, we'll talk about which one we would want to do in this case. Uh, squared, but uh, so the way it's set up, let's go, let's go look at it and then we'll, we'll talk about what the alternative hypothesis should be. So uh, Bill is uh, driving to work. Uh, he doesn't want to be late to work, and he's got two different routes, route A and route B. And he already knows that the average times are similar, um, but he wants to drive the one that has a smaller standard deviation if he can, because you don't want to have inconsistent times to get to work, right? You don't want one day it takes five minutes and the next day it takes 30 minutes, right? That'd be one, frustrating, and two, you wouldn't know when to leave, right? You'd, you'd get to work late some of the time, or, you know, you'd get, you'd get there super early all the time. Um, and you don't want that. So he wants to, you know, drive the route that has pretty much the same amount of time every day. So he drives each route uh, 20 times, just going to work, and, uh, and records the times on each route. And he comes up with a standard deviation of 3.8 minutes for route A and 4.6 minutes for route B. And uh, we're using a 10% level of significance this time. And can Bill say the routes have different standard deviations or not? Well, different standard deviations or not, that, that certainly implies um, not equal to for the alternative hypothesis. Now, we could, we could have some reason before gathering the information that Bill would think, oh, route B, uh, you know, I remember route B took me 45 minutes one day and, and 15 minutes the next day, right? I think that one's going to have a higher, higher standard deviation. He could do the test to see if like route B was bigger, had a bigger standard deviation than route A or, or whatever. Um, but we're going to do two-sided here because he's just checking to see if they're equal and he doesn't have an a priori assumption about that. So we get something that looks like this. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my F distribution. So this is going to be, here, I'll just, uh, I'll just sketch it out, right? So near one, looks something like that, right? Here's one. This is F1919. 19, 19. 19. Because it has 19 numerator degrees of freedom, numerator degrees of freedom go in the first slot, and then 19 denominator degrees of freedom, which go in the second slot, of course, because 
he had a sample size of 20 in both cases. He drives each route 20 times. So we got 20 on route A and 20 on route B. Um, and the way I've got this set up is I, I'm thinking of this as uh, S1 is, is our sig S1 squared is going to be the, the variance for route A and S2 squared is going to be the variance for route B. So I'm going to say that F is equal to, F statistic is equal to, um, I'm going to say uh, SA squared over SB squared, which is, let's go look, Uh, 3.8 squared over 4.6 squared. So it's 3.8 over 4.6 squared. And then we are literally just going to jam that into the calculator, and that's our F statistic, right? This is one of the simplest statistics we could possibly have, um, which is always nice. It's always nice to have a good one. So calculator is sort of working now, which is kind of nice. Uh, you just, like... I don't know if you guys were having this problem, but a student helped me with it. Um, I just assumed IT was going to fix the problem at some point, and that's so why I never, I never contacted them. But a student told me that they told her to go to vmview.sbcc.edu um, in an incognito window and um, use HTML access. So I assume it was some sort of caching problem. That's why you would use an incognito window, incognito. Um, mode doesn't store what you're what you do in that web browser into a cache like it just it just deletes it um and so i assume that's that's the problem that was the problem i, I don't know anyway this works so we're just gonna do this so we said this was 3.8 squared over uh 4.6 squared and uh there we go that is my that's my uh test test statistic is a uh, 0.682 yeah, that's close enough, 0.682. Let's go put that on the graph. So we had uh, this. Yeah, so we got the 0 0.682, so like here. And we're going to we're gonna be shading away from the mean. And of course, the mean is always one here. So here we go. This. And then there's, and then what we're going to do is double this it's not the same distance on the left and right that you go away from one it's that you capture the same area to the left of uh 0. 0.682 and to the right of it or into the right of whatever number you get over here so i'm not going to worry about what that number is we're just going to multiply by two so i'm going to do fcdf uh we're going to do fcdf of zero up to 0. 0.682 and then multiply that by two for to get uh, my p-value calculator so we're going to go fcdf which of course you find it in the same place as all the cdfs over here fcdf great lower zero upper 0 0.682 uh degrees of freedom for the numerator was 19 and for the denominator was also 19 and there we go uh 0 0.2058 so that's just that's just one half of it if I, when i multiply this by two that's my p-value is 0.4117 or probably 0.41. So we go back to here. So p-value, let's write that down. Uh, pink, where's my pink? There it is, p-value. That and this, those together. So we get, um, Oop, that's not the that's not the motion I meant to make. P value equals two times FCDF of zero to zero point six eight two with nineteen and nineteen degrees of freedom. Uh, it's about equal to zero point four one. So we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. Unsurprisingly, that is a as a big p value of uh, forty percent. We were using 10% for our alpha, but even that's not big enough to, to reject this. So um, yeah, I guess I'll write my conclusion right here. Let's say this data, this data does not suggest that Bill's routes have different standard, standard deviations that 
builds uh, routes work have different standard deviations. There we go. That's that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. Um, now I will say uh, you can do two sample F test in your calculator. I believe these calculators have two sample F uh, in stat and tests. Let's go look. I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember that stat tests. Uh, two sample F test. There it is. Yes, bam, right there. So uh, we can input either data or stats. As usual, we have statistics rather than raw data, and just give you thirty-eight or uh, forty times for Bill. Uh, S X one was three point eight. N1 was 20, SX2 was 4.6, and N2 was also 20, and we were doing not equal to. Hey, lo and behold, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference here is rounding error, right? I rounded it off to 0.682 instead of 6824196597. Um, yeah, but uh, you can see the calculator did exactly the same thing. Like if I was just doing this for myself, I would certainly just do a two sample, just use the uh, two sample F test function in the calculator. And I encourage you to do that as well. It's a perfectly useful function. Uh, it's, it's not a super common test, but it happens sometimes. Now, let me tell you about one use for uh, two sample F tests that I haven't talked about to this point and that we're not really going to use, but might come up if you ever do any more statistics in the future. Uh, if we go to stat tests and two sample T test, you might remember pooled. I just said always use no. And I mentioned that it was, you know, there's a little bit complicated and there was a, another test that you could do to determine if you should use pooled standard deviation or not. And the other test is the two sample F test, right? That's the one I was talking about because what we're doing with pooled is we're saying, if we put pooled on yes, we're saying that sigma one equals sigma two. Um, and so therefore there's some, some tricky-ish math that you can do with that. Um, I don't, know, I don't care to, to delve into because it's, it's only minor, minor improvement anyway. Um, but that's the test I was talking about is that it, when you're doing a two sample t-test, you can determine if you want to use pooled standard deviation by doing a two sample f test on the two, uh, on the two standard deviations or variances. Like if you're putting them into the calculator, it's standard deviations, but technically f is a ratio of variances. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's the test you can do. If you would like to do this, you can. You can gain a little bit of extra precision. Maybe I'll put a little, I don't know, bonus question. I don't even know how you do bonus questions in master grading. Maybe I'll figure out a way to do a bonus question. Like let like you skip something else if you do this or whatever. But uh, this it's how you can tell to whether you should use pooled standard deviation or not in a two sample t-test. That's, that's probably the most common use of a two sample f test to be honest, but uh, yeah, there's a there's an option. I don't know why my screen is, is flickering like this. It's driving me nuts. Anyway, um, I think that's about all I really wanted to say about these. So get the whiteboard, make sure I got everything. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little bit more complicated when we get to analysis of variance. We get to ANOVA. Uh, oh, I do have a blank page here. That might show up in the whiteboard. We'll see. Um, but I think I'm going to leave that for another video to explain. I feel like this is a this is a nice intro starter video. Uh, all right. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and stop here, and I will see you guys in the next video.